and in all of these things father we know that we are more than conquerors in all of these things we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus praise the Lord I know that um, some of y'all may not be here the last time I spoke about what it means to be more than a conqueror anybody here remember what I was talking about when I said this is what it really means to be more than a conqueror okay Manuelita is trying to look it up on her phone I see you God is good Alrighty, Lady Miriam, good to see you here. God is good. Alan, good to see you too. Thanks for coming out. Um, and good to see that Antoine came in and he just came to sit in front without, you know. Yeah, come on now. Yeah, praise God. It's a, it's a, new, it's a new day. It is a new day indeed. When I felt someone standing close to me, I was like, man, is it an angel of the Lord? And I looked at him, it was him. I said, okay, he, he might as well be an angel of the Lord. I mean, it's almost as much a miracle. You know, God is good. So the Bible says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You know, if you are a conqueror, if there is a victory that is yours and a territory that goes with the claim of victory, you know that for you to remain a conqueror, you have to keep fighting. You never conquer a people and expect that, oh, that's, that's it, it's over. You can ask the Romans about what I'm talking about. The Roman Empire, as it kept spreading and spreading, they had to keep fortifying their armies because to be a conqueror, you have to keep conquering. How many people remember the, um, what is that empire that is believed to have been the largest empire in um, the, what's, what, which one? Empire. Not the Roman Empire, there was one that was larger than, than it. Oh, no, no, even larger than the Ottoman Empire. Where are the history people in here? Okay, let's keep guessing. Okay, I'm, we're having a guessing fun here. Okay, so let's start all over again. Okay, so you're not allowed to say the empire of Zexis. Okay, if that's what you're thinking about, because remember that the empire of Zexis, who was also called Hazros in the book of Esther, was from India to Ethiopia, right? We knew that there were a couple of Persian kings that were made subject to him. He ruled over 127 provinces. So that was pretty large. But there is one empire that was larger than all of them. Uh -uh. Egyptian Empire? Anybody ever heard of Egyptian Empire? <laughs> it's not the British Empire. The British Empire. The British Empire was very well promoted. You know, they used to say, they used to say that um, the sun never sets on the British Empire, right? Say that again. Persian? No. The Mongolian Empire. You must have Googled that, didn't you? <laughs> Oh yeah, the Mongolian Empire is on record to uh, have been the largest empire ever. But whenever you think about the Mongolian Empire, what do you think about? Josephine says, I think about the fact that I've never heard of it. <laughs> oh yeah, well you see, that's what happens when you get conquered, all of your conquest gets relegated. It's intentional. You see, because whoever conquers you or whoever challenges your conquest would not want you to be remembered so that you don't even constitute rivalry in the minds of the people who have taken reins from you and the ones that the Lord over. You understand what I mean? And so the Mongolian Empire, the reason why it took forever and it took the rescue of, um, of a sudden guest You, you see, what did she say? <laughs> British. <laughs> no, no. It took... <laughs> no, no, let's go there. But we had all the guesses, but, you know, someone was inspired. Let's not, call, let's, let's not call that a guess. You know, I think you were inspired to... Olivia was inspired to rescue us from the guessing game. And the reason why that is, is because since they lost the reins, everyone who's come after them has done everything possible to make it seem 
like they did not know what they were doing, like the Mongolian Empire was a fluke and all that and all that and all that. But the reality of it is, for those who know about the Mongolian Empire, one thing that readily comes to mind was the fact that they kept on fighting. There was not a day that they sat and said, well, we have conquered most of the known world. Now we're just going to sit and, and cross our arms and, or, and put our feet up. No, they couldn't do that. Why? Because there was always battle even in their palaces. Now, if you are a conqueror, you know too well about what it takes than to sit down and rest. Because there is always somebody that you have conquered that wants to rebel. There is always somebody within the ranks of your royalty that wants a taste of power. It is not enough for people to be in the corridors of power. They always want more. Ever heard of a guy called Lucifer? Right? He wanted more. I mean, can you imagine wanting more? You were the cherubim. The Bible says, behold the anointed cherub made so beautiful by the Lord and equipped in all areas of music that even his body parts produced melody unto the Lord. The Bible says he had the responsibility of covering the glory of God's presence with his wings. He was always there right next to God. But that wasn't enough. He wanted a throne. He wanted to sit next to God. He knew that whenever people came, they came to make obeisance to God. He says, no, I don't want that. He said, I want the gathering of the people to come to me. He says, now I will, make, I will arise and make my throne next to the Almighty. And then the congregation of the people will come to me because people never want enough. And so that is the reason why the conqueror needs to keep conquering. Have you ever seen a, box, a boxer who has a title, who has a belt? You, to, you have to keep fighting to keep the belt. The belt is not your mom's property. It's a title that belongs to whatever tournament that is. So when you think about being a conqueror, it is not as enjoyable as most people think. Uneasy, they say, lies the head that wears the crown. And so if Jesus had done all of what he did only for us to become conquerors, then he hasn't done us a favor. Because then he can't just sit in heaven leaving us to be conquerors on the earth because then we have to keep fighting. And so what he did was he made us more than conquerors. To be more than a conqueror is to have a victory that cannot be challenged. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us with an everlasting love. So if we had conquered Satan by fighting him in a fist fight, if we had gotten the victory of salvation by going to hell ourselves with swords and spears, then we would have continued in the same practice of warfare to maintain the victory. But the Bible says the way we got the victory was because God loves us. So because we conquered by the love of God, we are more than conquerors because that love is eternal. That means we cannot stop being victorious. And we just need to keep reminding ourselves of the fact that we are not conquerors. You know why? Because to think as a conqueror is to make room for a challenge that could lead to you being overthrown. And that's how the devil wants you to think. The devil wants you to think that Jesus just got lucky on the cross. The devil just wants you to think that when the Bible says Jesus went deep down into hell and spoiled all principalities and powers, the devil wants you to think that that victory is not for you, that it wasn't given to you, that you still have to earn your own victory. The Bible says that we do wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Yes, we do wrestle, but the wrestle that we wrestle is from a place of knowing that our victory cannot be overturned. And the wrestle that we wrestle is simply because they just come and bother us. And you just can't keep letting them bother you. You do something just to keep them back. But you know that they cannot take what has been given to you because it's eternal. You see, the confidence with which we fight is what determines whether we win or we lose. Because if we fight thinking that maybe we might lose, then we just might lose. 
But if we fight knowing fully well that what we have is an eternal victory that was forged in God's love, delivered by God's grace, and maintained by God's own sweet fellowship, then you know what? Your confidence every time you wake up is going to be always high and where it needs to be because without that confidence, you cannot take the land. The world teaches you that the more you acquire, the more you attain, the more confident you will be. My wife was talking to me about her mentor when she was still practicing nursing in the United Kingdom. And the mentor said to her one day, what is the difference between you and I when we're standing in front of clients? And my wife says, well, you seem to sound more like you know what you're doing. She said, but it doesn't mean like I know more than you. I just sound like that because I've become confident with time. You see, confidence in the world from a world standpoint is summarized by what that lady said. She became confident because of her experience, because of her conquest, because of the places that she has been, what she's done, who she's met, the courses that she's gone to. But in the kingdom of God, you need to be confident first before you win. God said to Joshua, after Moses was taking up, God said to Joshua, because God knew that Joshua was not filling up to it. And so God came to him and he said to him, Joshua, you see that land? that is right ahead of you is yours to possess. But if you are going to possess the land, you have to be bold. You have to be courageous. Now you see how different God thinks to the way the world thinks? The world teaches you that you will be more confident the more you get done and the more you attain. And so you're always striving to get more. You're always striving to do more. And God is saying, you can't even get anything done that heaven registers as meaningful if you don't begin with being confident. When the disciples saw all of what had happened, Jesus was raised from the dead. They were so eager and so excited to go preach the gospel. Jesus called them back. He says, where are you going? They're like, you said go into all the world and we're going. He says, no, not yet. He said, you have to wait until you have received power from on high, simply because Jesus knew that the gospel that they must preach must be preached with confidence. And that was the reason why it was said that on the day that the Holy Spirit came and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter spoke with boldness and 3,000 people got born again. The difference between that Peter and the Peter that denied Jesus three times within the space of a couple of hours was the fact that this time around, he was a more confident Peter. He had the boldness because he had received the power. One of the things that the Lord's been making very clear to me is that majority of us will struggle with living in victory, will struggle with enjoying the fullness of salvation simply because we're not yet confident in who we are and what we have received. You see, that confidence is very critical. You need to know in your heart of heart that you are already more than a conqueror so that whenever the enemy seems to be gaining the upper hand, you will call him out for the illusion that he is playing or the, the tricks that he is playing on your mind. Satan is out to bend your mind every time. Because if he doesn't play those tricks on you, he is no match for you. Simply because you are made in the image and in the likeness of God and you are a new creation according to the similitude of Christ. The same Christ Jesus who single-handedly went to hell and dealt a blow on all the horde of darkness. But if you don't know who you are and if you do not know that your victory is guaranteed by love that never fails, you would always be hesitant in moving forward and taking grounds on the enemy. Because one day you will wake up and you will not be feeling like it. And Satan will tell you that you may have to give up today. If you start feeling like this in the morning, you know what the rest of your day is going to look like. And quite often we agree with him and we expect that things will not be all that great because of how we woke up. Quite often we show up in face of situations and challenges and the enemy convinces us. In fact, sometimes before the devil comes, you convince yourself that you are not prepared for what you're looking at. You keep remembering all the things that you should have done that you haven't done and you defeat yourself in your own mind. And when the devil comes, the devil's like, oh, the work is already done. So let this one pass because you're not ready for it. You see the place of boldness and confidence in God? Because you need it to be able to take that which is yours. All of the enemy strategy 
is what intimidation the bible says do not be ignorant of the devices of satan the bible did not say oh be mindful of the power of satan why because all power was given to jesus and jesus says i have given it to you and so if all power has been given to you then the only thing the enemy is using against you are what the bible calls the wiles of the enemy all the maneuverings all of the craftiness of satan job had a revelation into the fact that the devil hated him. You know his name is Job, which means to be hated. Job means to be hated. And that is the reason why many people hate their jobs. <laughs> Though I look it up, the origin of the word job is the same Hebrew word called Job, which means to be hated. So Job knew how hated he was. Oh, he got quiet in here. I pray that you fall in love with what you do. Or maybe the prayer should be, I pray that you find what you are in love with to do. You understand what I mean? You know, because quite often the reason why we're, we are where we are at is because of what we didn't know when we got started. But you're no longer the same you that started that job. You're no longer the same you that was hired. And so you don't have to stay there if, that, if you've outgrown the place. The same power that brought you to where you're at can take you to where you need to be and can make a way where there seems to be no way. But you need to be confident in the process. You understand what I mean? So there's no point going. I'm not saying don't go tomorrow because you still have bills to pay. You understand what I mean? Because then someone's going to say, well, the man of God just reminded us that if you don't love it, you don't have to show up. You understand what I mean? <laughs> uh, the Bible says line has to be upon line. Precept has to be upon precept. I tell you one thing that God is always expecting of us to deliver, and that is a plan. You don't necessarily need to know how that plan will materialize. You just need to have a plan. The Bible says a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And so if you don't have a plan, you're not giving God anything to work with. So don't just walk away. Have a plan and put it before God and let God put all the steps in place and tell you when it's time to move. You see, the children of Israel recognized one thing and that they don't move until the cloud has moved. Moses said, if we don't see your cloud go ahead of us, we are not going anywhere. Okay, so the moment you receive an insight or a revelation is not when you move, you move when God moves. And that is after you have made a plan and he has made the steps. Let me give you another scripture. The Bible says that the preparation of the heart belongs to man, but the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. You need to prepare to get out of where you are at, but if you keep thinking that that is the way it should be because everybody around you don't like, come, nobody around you likes coming to work and they keep coming and you tell yourself, I think people just have to hate their jobs. I think that's the way it is. No, that is not the way it should be. God intends for you to have life and have it more abundantly and that does not include going to a job that you do not like and so if you don't like it if it's taking your joy rather than giving you joy what do you do you change the situation by presenting to God a plan and what should your plan mostly constitute of your plan should mostly constitute of your desires not your abilities and I'm going to say that again slowly you know many of us will make plans based on what we can do and that is the reason why we're not getting things done. Because what you think you can do, you really can't even do. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. So even though you think, oh, I can do this. So you make plans on your ability and heaven is looking at you and they're like, no, you can't. But the devil is like, well, if you think you can, you can. You know how these motivational speakers continue to twist the word of God. You know, these days they say, oh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he think and grow rich. And you've been thinking and you've been... Stinking. <laughs> Just trying to rhyme like motivational speakers, but it, you know, maybe I'll try again next time. See me on Saturday, I may be better at rhyming. No, but the reality of it is, you know, they quote that scripture, how many people have heard that? Where they tell you that even the Bible says, you know, as you think in your heart, so are you. The next time anybody says that to you, ask them where is it in the Bible? The Bible never says that you need to go around just thinking and thinking alone. Where that scripture came from is in the book of Proverbs, wherein the Bible says, when you come before a miserly person, and that miserly person that you already assessed 
you already know is a miser. If he offers you something to eat, be careful because he will do to you as he is thinking. That's what the Bible says. The Bible was talking about the miserly person. The reason why the miserly person is miserly is because they think of scarcity. They think that what they have is not going to be enough for you. It's not even enough for them. And the Bible says as they are thinking, so are they. So they will deal with you. Whatever they put in front of you is not real. Even if they put a muscle in front of you, there's a rope tied to it. Before you swallow it, they pull it back. But people have gone ahead to say that, why, why are things not happening for me? Does the Bible not say that I should just think about it? No, you do more than thinking, you make a plan. And that plan needs to be based on your desire because God is not committed to move to the tune of your ability. He's only committed to moving to the tune of your desires. Because he said to you, I will grant the desires of your heart. So make a plan for getting out of that place and make sure that that plan is such a plan that would only work if God is in it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because many of us, and I'm just going to dwell on this for a little bit. Let me teach you how to make a simple plan. So let's still use the same job situation as an example. I'm going to say two things foundational very quickly. Many of us, there are two things that we need to be aware of. What you love and what you're good at. They're two different things for most people. Some people, what they love is what they're good at, right? But what you're good at, and this is where it gets confusing for most people, keeps changing. What you're good at now does not have to be what you're going to be good at tomorrow. And what you're not good at today, you could be excellent at tomorrow. But what you love mostly stays the same. So the two things that I'm saying that has to be a foundation for your plan making is you need to make a plan that begins with what you're good at but towards what you love. So your starting point is what am I good at? So I'm going to make my plan beginning with what I am good at, but I'm going to make that plan to end in the fulfillment of what I love. And quite often what you will find is that somewhere along the line between A and B, your abilities will no longer be enough. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so if what you're good at, right? If what you're good at is selling million dollar homes, that's what you're good at. No, no, let's start with if that's what you love. Because if you're already good at selling million dollar homes, you probably would not be listening to me talk about this thing. You already know what you're doing. So let's say what you love is to one day be selling million dollar homes. That's what you love to do. But at the moment, what you're good at is studying for exams. You don't like it, but you're good at it. You understand what I mean? So where do you begin your plan? You begin your plan with saying, okay, when you want to sell million dollar properties, you need a license and that license requires an exam. Okay, I'm going to prepare my plan based on these three things, what I'm good at, what I love, and what is required. So you make your plan and then you present that plan to God. Whether you will have favor with the person that will let you into this network of people selling million dollar homes because it's like a cult, Ask Antoine, he's going to tell you. You don't just wake up one day and you start selling million dollar properties. They will find you. They will question you. They will wonder who is your godfather. Where are you from? How did you get into this industry? So that's where you need God. You need that favor for him to make a way where there seems to be no way. And so that is your plan. You make your plan beginning with what you're good at. And the reason why you make your plan beginning with what you're good at today, I used to be good at passing professional exams, but I'm no longer good at it. If you put any exam in front of me right now, I will give it back to you as you gave it to me. You understand what I mean? But I used to study for the toughest professional exams overnight. And I never failed one. The one that I failed it was because I chose to fail it. Story for another day. But... The deal is this, when you make that plan, many of us will try to play God and that is the reason why God is not playing for us. Because God says, I'm a jealous God, which is, I don't like competition. 
while you're still God, I will not be in your world. Because there cannot be two of me because I am God and there is no other. So to play God is to make that plan and once you've made the plan, now you want to make all the steps on your own. That is where people get bogged down. And you know what typically happens to people, Chris? The moment they get to that point, they get overwhelmed, they give up and they stay in the same place. A lot of people who have plans, who have made plans or who have the desire to get out from where they're at, get overwhelmed with the steps. And that is why people say the devil is in the details. Because if you don't let God handle the details, Satan will take advantage of the details to weigh you down. And so you ask them, but I thought you said you wanted to be in real estate and sell million dollar homes. They're like, girl, when I thought about having to do this and having to do that, and after a while, I was just like, this is too much. Yes, it's too much for you because you're a man. But it's never too much for the God who says the details are mine. Let me, let, me, let me take care of the details. I have a bigger processor than you. I know the past, the present, and the future. In fact, I am the past, the present, and the future. Every detail, the people you will meet, what the market will look like tomorrow, you don't know. So don't worry about it. Leave that to me. So I tell you what, if you would listen to what Jesus said when he says my burden is light and my yoke is easy and just do the part that God's word says is yours to do, you will have the confidence, the boldness, and the freedom to wait for God to break down the steps. Just make a plan. Your plan should be that simple. I am going to start with what I am good at today. Because what's in your hand is what's going to deliver what is out there that you're waiting to receive. Everybody that God went to, God always asked them, what's in your hand? What you got? I'm ready to work with what you have. Moses was supposed to deliver three million people from bondage against the strongest army known at the time, against the most advanced civilization of their time and possibly of all times. And all he had in his hand was not a degree, it was just a stick. And God was like, we can work with that. Yeah, we can work with that. Absolutely. We can work with that. There is always something in your hands. And that is something you can do now. You can write that exam now. Write the exam. Keep your eye focused on selling million dollar properties. That is your plan. It doesn't have to be more than six lines. And let God fill in the 300 words that you have to write in that email to get the first gig. Let God fill in the person that you need to talk to. Let God make every one of those things happen. You all know my story when I first dropped out of college. My plan was very simple. My plan was this. I knew how to build computers. That was something that I was good at. But what I wanted to do is what I love seeing myself do, which is to be a global consultant, going from boardroom to boardroom. But nobody was going to put me in their boardroom unless they had doors to wipe and windows to clean. Because that was all I had the skill for at the time. I didn't have the experience, nor the skill. And the more I thought about it, the more it weighed me down. I'm like, why do I keep seeing myself doing all of these things? And here I am, struggling to even pass my little exam at school, struggling to make my head of department happy. He's asking me to do this and I find it too much. I got overwhelmed by those things until I found the scripture that says a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord guides his steps. So I decided that I was not going to worry anymore about the steps and just do what I knew to do. I was building computers for people. People. And then I started building computers for my dad. And when I built the computers, it was like, and they talked to each other like the one at the bank. I said, we can make it happen. I connected them and one thing led to the other. I connected a couple of computers and one day somebody came from the office of the federal government and they said, we have a project connecting computers just like this. Who helped you? And my dad was like, my son, where is he? I don't know, but I can find him. Within about 48 hours, they produced me to the man. No degree, no experience other than building computers. And he said to me, if you'll be so kind to follow me to our campus, we need to connect two buildings. And we've talked to three companies and they couldn't connect it. Now, this is where it gets wild. This is where you need God. I couldn't have built that into my plan. That is the favor of God because for some reason he saw that I had connected no more than 12 computers in the little office and he was asking me to come and look at about 100 computers in each building and they want to connect about two of them. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Is that that this man is trying to impress somebody at work or he's trying to make a fool of all of us? But let us go. 
And when we got there, the moment we got there, I realized that what they needed was something that I had just read like the day before. Two days prior, I didn't know how to connect those two buildings. But just the day before, I heard that there was a new technology that was called the STP, the shielded twisted pair. And this cable can connect computers over 100 meters apart. And I told the guy, I was like, these two buildings is nothing. He was like, that's what I thought. I said, I can connect them. And the rest, as they say, is history. Six months from that conversation or less, not only was I consulting for that federal government, I was also consulting for the American government. Three years after that, I was working for the British government and I had no degree. If I had looked at all of what was required for me to meet the requirements, I would not have left where I was. I would not even have built that one little computer that I was building. But guess what? I found the secret was that I just needed to make a plan and let God iron out the details. And that was exactly what he did every step of the way, ironing out the details. Somewhere along the line, after I started making some money, it became apparent. One of my friends said to me, he said, this thing is going to get into your head and you're not going to go back to school. I said, why should I go back to school? <laughs> he said, what if one day you find out that you need the degree? I said, with what I have seen of God so far, the moment a degree becomes a need, he will give it to me and he'll give me a really good one. The best there is. That was what I told him. Because I had already seen that it is not mine to worry about. At that particular point in time, I didn't need it to do what I was doing, and that was all I knew. Let him worry about the details. God wants to take you further than you can ever imagine. He just needs you to trust him with the details. He wants to know where you want to be, though. He wants to see your desire. Lay your desire on him, and because he is God, he can figure it out. If I can figure it out on my own, I don't need God. Whatever I can figure out on my own and fully execute on my own cannot be the reason why they placed me here on earth because God put every one of us here so that we can accomplish something in partnership with him. So if I can do it on my own, I don't need God. That was what I told that gentleman. I think about five years after I had that conversation with him, you know what happened? Six years after we had that conversation. I got a phone call and then an email. And you know what it was about? I was being invited to Royal Holloway, the University of London, to come and do a master's program in information security. So I was like, okay, you all know that I do not have a first degree. They said, yes, but your industry accomplishments is actually more than what some people have who are teaching the bachelor's program. So they gave me an unconditional admission into a master's program directly. Look at how many steps that I jumped in life just because those steps were not mine to make, they were God's to make. About three months into the master's program, I was teaching others. I wasn't just a student. I was helping other people out. I was teaching others. Six months into the program, I got a job overseas. Nine months into the program, I had two job offers waiting on the table. The United Nations wanted the, uh, the, United, uh, the World Bank gave me an employment and they asked me to tell them what I wanted. Now, I hadn't even gotten that degree. I was still doing the master's when that happened. Let me tell you something, folks. We are doing too much, and that is why we end up with too little. Because the more you do, the less you give God to do. I'm not teaching laziness, but what I am teaching is knowing your place. If you put all of that effort that you have put into trying to construct all the plans on all the details on your own, if you put all that into reinforcing your desires and making sure that nothing moves you from where you're at, if you put all that effort in building your confidence in the God of the process, guess what happens? You would be doing your part very well. The Bible says whatsoever your hand finds to do, do with all your heart. And once you have done it, guess what? Go to rest and let God go to work. I know somebody in here today is very unhappy with where they're at because this wasn't what I was talking about but the moment I mentioned a job and people not being happy I felt such a strong burden 
You know that there are times when you can actually smell the tears coming from someone because the tears have mixed with every kind of fluid that can come from their face. That thing is not a fragrance. It is painful to watch, to sense, and to pick up on. So if you're here today, this entire service might be just about you. And it is okay. Because there are several times where when Jesus organized meetings with several people present and we end up having the record of only one miracle. It is okay if there's only one woman with the issue of blood in here today. It is perfectly okay. But if that is you, God wants to take you from where you're at and where you're struggling, wherein you don't even believe enough in the God that you serve. He wants to take you from where you have been to a place wherein you can say, this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in my eyes. I want to encourage you. I said something earlier and I want to revisit it. Don't make your plans based on your ability. Let your ability be your starting point. And you know what is important about having your ability, what you know how to do, be your starting point? Because if it's the starting point, it will be the least part of your progress. Because what you're going to do is you're going to step on it and put it beneath you and say, God, where do we go from here? I'm already standing on what I know how to do. That means the next step has to come from you. And the steps will come. Because God is faithful. The Bible says faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. I'm going to pray for a couple of people and then I'm going to invite John to come and share a testimony uh, very quickly. But before we do all of that, I will tell you two things very quickly that God impressed upon my heart for today's service. And one of those things, without even discussing with anybody, Alan came here and he says, he says henceforth, Know we no man after the flesh. For Christ, whom we once knew after the flesh, we no longer know him according to the same. What all that King James English means is this. There was a time that Jesus was referred to as flesh and blood. But after resurrection, the only time they mentioned his flesh, it was called flesh and bones. Because he had already bled out that blood. And so we no longer know him as a man in the flesh. Now we know him as the force of life. And so one of the things that the Lord impressed upon my heart is that many of us, we keep regarding people as people and that is the reason why we miss out on what God intends for them to do in our lives. You know, there have been times wherein I've gone to places, I've said hello to people and they've just said hello to me casually and then they come back later and they're like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was you. Has that ever happened to you before? Wherein people just greet you casually because they don't know who you are. And then later they come and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was you. And the reason why they do that, I don't understand. So if you didn't know that was me, who did you think that was? And is this how you treat people if you don't think they're important? You see, this has happened to me even in my own home, wherein we'd have birthday parties for the children and people will come, you know, because we'll invite their classmates and they'll bring their parents and they see me there in shorts and, and trying to welcome everybody. And, and every now and again, they think I'm just the guy that was invited to make sure that the place is clean afterwards. <laughs> One man said to me once before, very honestly, he said, you know, for some reason I, I thought, and I, I mean this in a nice way, that you were just helping them clean the place. I said, well, you're right, because I also clean the place, even though I live here. You understand what I mean? My name is on the title, too. You understand what I mean? And so here is the deal. This is what I have always wondered. So if you greeted me like that the first time, and you came back the second time with honor, so where was that honor when you first of all disregarded me? The Bible says, be kind to strangers because by so doing, many have entertained angels unwittingly. There are so many angels that the Lord has dispatched for your sake, but you keep mistreating them. And when you maltreat the angels, they can't deliver their payload because they're not supposed to give heaven's blessings to some disgruntled, ungrateful, and dishonoring fellow. They're supposed to give God's blessings to God's children, and God's children are honorable. But many of us, we miss out on the opportunity simply because we treat people as though they are nothing. Let me tell you something. Everybody is somebody. 
Everybody's somebody. Even the people that you grew up with, you are not supposed to trivialize anybody because of familiarity. My older brother calls me Pastor Moses. He doesn't have to. When we were little, he used to smack me in the back of the head. The last time that I was in Nigeria and he picked me up from the airport, he picked me up as though I was a guest minister. By the time I got to the hotel that I was going to, the director of the hotel was there to receive me and I was thinking to myself, I'm just this guy's younger brother. <laughs> but he understands that everybody is somebody before the one who made them. God made everyone in his image and in his likeness. Stop trivializing people just because you think you know them. I tell people, you don't know me if you don't know my God. Because the Bible says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you. It is time to repent from dead works. It is time for you to treat everybody you meet as though they are royalty. Give the best of you everywhere you go. Because that is what matters. You know, when those people came to Jesus, I give this example on Saturday, and Jesus says they were not going to enter into God's rest. And they questioned why Jesus would deny them. They said, well, Jesus, did you forget we did miracles in your name? We were the ones healing people in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know you. But the ones who were humble enough to stand back, watching the TV evangelists and the authors and all the celebrities get turned down. Those ones were the ones Jesus said to, come close. And they were like, uh, are you sure you want us? These other people didn't make it. He said, yeah, but you were the ones who fed me when I was hungry. When I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. You are the good Samaritans. You are the ones who were servants of others. And the Bible says the greatest in the kingdom will not be the prophet, the greatest in the kingdom will not be the apostle. The greatest in the kingdom will be the one who is the servant of all. Treat people with respect. The thief, one of the thieves that was crucified along with Jesus, what was his ticket to paradise? Because he was nice to Jesus. The thief on the one side was like, what is, why are you feeling funky? You're just like the rest of us. And the thief that made it into paradise just said to the other one, come on, be nice. Just be nice. Speak to the man kindly. I mean, that's the least you can do. And Jesus said to that thief today, you will be with me in paradise. That thief did not know the Lord's prayer. That thief did not even know John 3, 16. That thief did not even know the first thing about being saved. But at the end of the day, that thief knew something that heaven is always looking for the recognition of the presence of God in the human form. As yes, I want to encourage you, wherever you find yourself, don't miss an opportunity to be kind, to be honoring. The people do not have to deserve it. You see, the secret behind being kind to everybody is that somewhere along the line, you hope that you will be kind to those who do not deserve it. When you show kindness and love to those who do not deserve it, it releases from heaven blessings that you don't deserve. Because God cannot allow himself to be in debt to you. So when you give people what they don't deserve, God has to give you what you don't deserve to maintain the balance of life. He said, whoever lends unto the poor, gives, whoever gives to the poor, lends to God, and he will repay. Because God doesn't want to be walking around and he's like looking at his ledger and he owes John a hug, he owes, he owes John an opportunity to prosper because that's what he's done for other people. So what does he do? He, sends to, he says to his angels, find John and bless him. Quickly, quickly, quickly while it is hot. Because God was the one who says a laborer is worthy of his wages and the sweat of the brow of the laborer must not dry before you pay him that which is due. That's what the word of God says. You don't wait until the sweat of the brow is dry. God does not do net 30. The reason why you're not receiving the blessing is because you're not ready for it. The moment you're ready for any blessing, it is yours. And this is how you make yourself ready, by being kind. I said two things, but it's already 8.55 and I still want John to share that testimony for five minutes. So the second thing, I've already said it somewhat, but I'm gonna just quickly mention this. And this is where we're gonna begin our prayers tonight. 
And here is the deal. The Lord reminded me something very sharply. It reminded me very sharply of something just yesterday. And it hit me that many of us actually live our lives without really considering the power of thus saith the Lord. The Bible says that God made all things by the word of his power and he upholds all things by the same. And so we live our lives believing more in our own abilities, believing more in what somebody else said than we believe in what God says. This should not be received as just another cliche. This should be received as a point of repentance. We need to genuinely repent from taking the word of God for granted. If we would simply believe what the word of God says, I know that sounds like something that we've heard again and again, but if we truly believe, then everything would be possible to us. And so if there is still anything in your life that seems impossible, if there is anything in your life that seems unattainable, is because there is still a word of God or from God that you haven't believed as you should because God cannot lie. He says to him who believes, nothing shall be impossible. Have you been finding it impossible to move from your rented house to a house that you own? Have you been finding it possible to have a change of career to one that actually works for you, your family, and for your joy? Are those things eluding you? Some people, what actually eludes us is consistent peace. The moment you think, oh, now I can breathe, something hits you. The moment you feel like, okay, now the Lord has made room, something hits you, and you're just asking God for a break. You just want to be at peace for three months. God, is not too much to ask. And God says, no, it is not even too much to give. But do you believe? Because to him who believes, nothing shall be impossible. Let's stop blaming God and blaming heaven. Let's just search within us. What is that word that God gave me that I've not yet believed? Let me give you an example of one of the words that God gave to me that I did not believe in time. And it's this. The Bible says the Lord gives to his beloved sleep. And quite often I don't sleep because I'm processing this and processing that and processing this and processing that. And one day the Lord said to me very clearly, he said to me, remember, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I will be trying to conquer four days at the same time. And that's because I did not believe. If I believe that sufficient unto each day is the evil thereof, once it is bedtime, if that email has not been responded to, we will catch it another day. The Bible says you stay up late and you wake up early only to eat the bread of sorrows. Many of us are doing too much. Again, that's why we have too little. Because as far as God is concerned, when you're still believing like that, overworking yourself, just so that you can please people, you will not please your heavenly father. Your heavenly father wants to see that you believe in him more than you believe in yourself. I remember when I was still actively consulting in the marketplace, people would ask of you because they think they're paying you the big bucks or oh, you're a consultant. They will even tell you when you're getting on the plane on Thursday or Friday, they will say, well, you know, you guys get the big bucks, so we're not expecting you to rest this weekend. By Monday, we want the report. People will say things like that to you. And one day after I was losing sleep and losing joy, I just realized that, wait a minute, I don't believe God. He said on the Sabbath, rest. Jesus said the Sabbath is made for men, not men for the Sabbath. Don't be killing yourself trying to observe the sa Sabbath. You're killing yourself by not observing it. He wants you to take it and rest. At least have one day a week to rest. If God rested, who is God? Why are you not resting? Are you better than God? Are you stronger or mightier than he? You understand what I mean? So I put my foot down and I told my wife, I said to my wife, this was in 2015 or so, I said to my wife, I said, going forward, I'm not responding to anybody's email once it's 6 p.m. or the sun goes down on Friday until the sun goes down on Saturday. From sundown to sundown, I am not responding to any email. I'm not even looking at it. I turn the notifications off. Anybody that wants to go and hit the wall, let them hit the wall. I will still be here. I had a big deal with a company and the CEO of the company challenged me. He said to me, he said, I've noticed that, you know, you don't respond to email as quickly. I said to him, I said, when did you email me? He said, I emailed you on Saturday. I said, oh, that's my day of rest. And you know what he said? He says, oh, I'm sorry. 
The reason why people take us for a ride is because we bend in front of them like a donkey. If you bend like a donkey, people will take you for a ride. And I'm not even using the original word for donkey because if I did, you know exactly what I mean. And so you need to choose to be confident in God. We're going to break bread in just a moment, but I want John to come and share a testimony to help our faith because I've got too much scriptures to read. And so when John's dad was here two Saturdays ago, okay, my wife says, let him share it. John, please come and share the testimony. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So my dad came uh, two Saturdays ago. Dad, uh, my grandmother, and my step-grandfather came all together. And uh, they came... They were at, my dad and mom came, though, to support my grandparents because my grandmother's been diagnosed with cancer. And my step-grandfather, he actually uh, passed away, and they shocked him back to life. And he uh, can't walk anymore. He's had two heart attacks. And uh, they both came. And it was amazing. He literally, he got out of the hospital, and they, like, came the next day. They're like, we're coming. And um, they got prayed over. And my dad wasn't even expecting, like, to be prayed over. But Pastor Moses was like, come here. And... Um, He's like, I got a word for you. My dad's like, okay. So he came forward, and I got it. I actually got it. Um, I, I recorded it. And pastor said, I saw um, a demon-possessed girl is going to come, come to you, a young girl. And uh, I don't know if you, if you were there, you remember it. And uh, you're going to pray for her, and her life's going to be changed. And I encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's two Saturdays ago, if you, you know, toward the end of the service. And uh, my dad called me, and we were up late, like, we were up pretty late because church didn't get out that day until like, I mean, it had to be like 10 o'clock. It was late. Uh, maybe a little after 10. And I know I got home like, I don't know, I think I got home like 1120. It was late. My dad calls me up and was like, you home? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you'll never guess what happened. And this was like, my dad called me at like a little after midnight. And he's like, I just got a call. Uh, my dad and mom, they own a boarding school. Uh, and my dad was like, uh, we got this new girl that came and this family called me up and he's like, I usually don't answer calls this late, but we're like driving home from church. And they called me up and said like, our daughter, we need you to pray for her. And my dad was like, okay, I don't really know anything about you. Uh, what's going on? And they're like, well, our daughter just started acting weird. Like she was screaming, she punched a hole in the wall. She literally tore her door off the wall. Like she literally put her hands on it and tore it off. And he, they were, I mean, this is a petite girl. Um, I mean, this girl's like five, two and like, maybe like 120 pounds. She's petite. And um, they were, my dad's like, uh, okay, I don't really know much about you. Do you believe in healing? What do you, what do you believe in? And they're like, yeah, that's why we called you up because we know you're a Christian school. And um, he goes, okay, uh, let's pray. And they said, no, 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 we want you to come in person. So uh, fast forward, my dad goes, uh, not that night, he slept, he prayed about it. And he was telling me about it, and I'm like, that's so weird. And my dad told me, he's like, isn't it weird? Pastor Moses said in the service that a demon-possessed girl would come. And he's like, I don't even know these people. And they call me on the way home from church. It's like almost, it's that same day. It's not even midnight. He's like, and why they call me? He's like, think about it. He's like, this girl's only been in our school for like a week and a half, two weeks most. He's like, they could have called, you know, they don't go to church with us. They don't. You know, she's just a late transfer. And like, why is she, why are they calling us? So it kind of all coming together. And then long story short, my dad goes and prays for him, puts his hands on the girl and uh, puts his hands on the family and they pray together. And the girl acts totally normal now. And she, they don't even know, even the girl said, listen, even the girl said, I don't know. Uh, my dad was telling me all the testament. My dad was like, he asked the girl, like, what's going on? And she said, I don't even know why I was acting that way. She said, I don't even know. She said, I was hitting the wall. I was screaming. I was throwing things. I literally yanked the door off. And she said, I've never done anything like that. And it, it uh, and remember, pastor said, a demon-possessed girl is going to come over. And my dad just literally prayed. He was like, what do you believe? And he prayed over the girl, and they have not had an incident since. What's interesting is, I didn't even tell pastor this, today... I got a call from DFAX, because I work closely with uh, Child Protective Services, uh, and I got a call from DFAX, and they asked me, they were like, do you know this girl? And I was like, I know the girl. I don't personally know her, but I know her name and I know her file. And they were like, do you think there's anything like uh, raw going to report with her? And I was like, I think she's healed, I think she's fine. 
And it all came full circle as pastor prophesied that day before they even like we went to sleep, contacted them. So it, it was, the whole thing's a testimony and it's life's change. It's amazing. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John. Praise the Lord. God is good. Like I said, I know that's going to help your faith. Okay, I know that you're trying to gain up for John, but this is me. I'm a little louder. Thank you. All righty. So we're going to break bread, but I want you to take two things at least from that testimony. I was going to pray for somebody else, I remember. In fact, I think it was your grandparents in the corner. And as I was going, the Lord showed John's dad to me, praying over a little girl, showing me even what she was wearing, and I saw the demons leave her. And that's why I turned to him, I said, a little girl will come your way, you will pray for her, and she's gonna be delivered. And thankfully, that same night, you know, quite often when you get a word like that, sometimes you're like, okay, maybe sometime in my future before Jesus comes, it's gonna happen. But that happened right there. And so I wanna encourage you, sometimes your miracle is on the way to helping somebody else. They didn't particularly come here for themselves. They came here because they wanted to support the grandparents. But look at what happened. They got a word from God. Let us not be hesitant when it comes to helping other people. Again, you just never know who the angel is. So we're going to break bread today. And just so that Alan knows that we read Bible here, I'm just going to quickly read to us from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 11, verse 17. Hopefully, one day before Jesus comes, we will move on from this Jeremiah, but who knows? Maybe this is the last chapter. Jeremiah eleven seventeen. The Bible says, For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. We read this on Saturday, I did some explaining, but the reason why we're reading it again today is because I don't believe we're there yet. We need to take this as we break bread again today to press in concerning this word. The reason why God is angry is that God says, I planted you, but you're taking the incense, the fruit of your planting, and you're offering it up to Baal. And so I want to encourage you. God planted you here. The Bible says you are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Let him get the best of you. He wants you to believe in him more than you believe in the system. He wants you to believe in him more than you believe in the banks. He wants you to believe in him more than you believe in what's coming out of the news. Do you act on the word of God as promptly as you act on what's in the news? Because some people, as soon as they hear something in the news, they go to buy some stock or they go to sell some stock because they have just heard an update that makes them feel, oh, this is what we need to do. We need to act on the word of God more promptly and more confidently than we do what's in the news. God says they acted against themselves because they provoked me. What provokes God is when you are not letting him have his place in your life. He doesn't just, he doesn't want to lord over you. He, he wants to show you his goodness. The Bible says God is good and God is love. So if anything that he, if anything at all, all of what he brings is goodness and love. Let him get the best of you. I said two scriptures. The other one is Matthew 27 verse 11. And then we're going to break bread. So Matthew 27 verse 11. It's along the same vein. So let's see what it says. And at this time, you can get ready to open your bread and speak life over your bread. The Bible says, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say. The governor said to what? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, yeah, I am. It is as you say. The Lord's been revealing to me lately that many of us don't even understand the reason why we're going through the challenges that we're going through. The governor here represents the forces that govern life. 
The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the forces that govern life. You are being tested because these forces want to know whether you are the king. Do you know who you are? Because as long as you don't know who you are, as long as you're still lost in the crowd, then you're not ready for the crown. There are forces that God has already set into motion. There are opportunities that God has already labeled yours, but they will only present themselves to your royal self, not to your worrying self. I can't imagine a king who has been given peace by God like Solomon, with peace all around, who still worries. Who is still fearful and hesitant to go out and give glory to God by taking a stand boldly in the name of God? Toward fulfilling destiny. The timidity, the hesitation is all rooted in the ignorance of self. Remember a month ago I reminded us that the Bible defines wisdom as this. That wisdom is that a man would know himself. Because if you know who you are in him, it's over. So the governors are asking you, the forces that govern life, Kenyatta, are you a king? If you are, we will know because all of the tests you will pass. A king is not going to be afraid. The Bible says a king is not afraid whose troop is with him. And what is your troop? The entire host of heaven is with you. Why are you afraid? There are doors God has shown you to knock and you're standing there and you're still shaking. If you are the king, you will knock because if they say who is there, you say it's the king. And once you are the king, the doors open. Even the Bible says the everlasting doors open because the king of glory is coming through. I ask you today, communion house, are you who God says you are? Life simply wants to know. That difficult spouse simply wants to know. That difficult child simply wants to know. If you are truly a king and an honorable father, you will get my obedience, but I need to know. And in reality, children need to know. They test you to see whether you're confident in the authority that God has given to you as the head of the household or as the parent. Your wife wants to know if you are a king worthy of submitting to by testing your patience sometimes because if you are the king, you will be patient. The Bible says it is dishonoring for a king not to be patient when it comes to matters of justice. So you have been tested in every way, but you keep fumbling because you don't know who you are. When you are king, what do you do? You sit on your throne and pass judgment. You don't run around looking for a stick to hit somebody with. The people who are using force are the people who do not know they have authority. Have you ever seen a situation where a policeman comes and it's like sticking his hand into your pocket to get your driver's license? No, they just ask you, give me your driver's license. Even though it's yours, $20, you paid for it. What do you do? You give it to them very happily with a smile on your face. You understand what I'm saying? Because it is authority. So I want to encourage you today. I know that our time is fast spent. If I let me, do you, let me do you a solid here. I'm going to summarize everything that I have said. I'll try in 90 seconds. I started today by talking to you about what it means to be more than a conqueror. To recognize that your conquest is rooted in the love of God. And the Bible says, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Having been saved by grace, will you now be made perfect by your works? I wasn't thinking of salvation when Jesus died for me. I was not even around. The Bible says he was slain before the foundations of the earth for the saints of the world that was not even yet made. God has already taken care of everything that pertains to your life and godliness. And that should be your confidence. It should be rooted in the love of God, not in what you can do. And along the way, we had a detour addressing the issue of that person who was having sleepless nights, whose blood pressure was going up, who was losing sleep, who was losing joy because they are doing what they hate. And God has for you something that you love, that you will enjoy, that will prosper you and bring you peace. For the word of God says it is the blessing of God that makes rich, adding no sorrow. God will not give you a job that will make you sorrowful. It will not give you a business that will take away your peace. So what do you need to do? Press into your destiny by making a simple plan that requires God for it to be fulfilled and let him run with it while you patiently wait for him to deliver.
And then we went on to talk about the fact that it is very expedient for us as children of God to not be disrespectful. Shower love and respect on people even though you think they don't deserve it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said to me, this message is very critical. He said, because we have more angels on earth now than we usually have. With all the happenings going on in the world today, do you know that according to prophecy, we know that every one of these signs that we're seeing from the earthquakes to the shootings to the falling stars to whatever you can think about can only happen by the hand of angels. Go and read Revelations. Every single one of those things, the angel of the Lord poured out a bowl, the angel of the Lord blew a trumpet, the angel of the Lord opened a vial, the angel of the Lord, the angel of, even the destructive things would happen by angels that God has released on assignment. And so if all these things are going on in the world today, we are living in unprecedented times wherein we have a multitude of angels on earth. You don't want to run into angels and be disrespectful. It is for your own sake. It's just a function of the times that we're in. It is better safe than sorry. Don't just take my word for it. God's word says, be kind to all. So you're not just dealing with men anymore. Even though men, you should respect. Because whatsoever you do to the least of the brethren, Jesus says the same you do to me. And lastly, before John came up, I reminded us of the significance of believing what God has said. To believe what God has said is to read it, to meditate upon it and to begin to act as though it is true. Just begin to act, begin to position yourself. Paul said something remarkable and I'm going to say that in 30 seconds. He says, for me, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child and I understood as a child. He said, but now I put away childish things. Look at the progression. He thought he spoke and then he understood. Many of us want to understand the fullness of what God's word is singing before we start to do it. Just do it and then the understanding will come. The word of God is not a light to your step. The Bible says it is a lamp to your feet and then a light to your path. You want him to illuminate the entire world before you make a move. He says, no, I don't have that responsibility toward you. I just want to illuminate one step because it's one step at a time. So once you have that one step, take it and keep taking the steps. And then before you know what's going on, your path is already illuminated. Stop waiting until God gives you the entire blueprint. What are you going to do with it? Just do the one thing now. Let it be a reflection of your confidence in God. And then we read this Jeremiah scripture. The Lord deserves the best of you. We read the Matthew scripture. Everything around you is testing to see if you know who you are. I pray for you today. In fact, I'm going to declare for you, over you today as many as have the heart to receive it, that the Lord will grant to you the, a special grace in the times that we're in to bear the fruits of patience and long-suffering. Everything that has been designed to try your patience you will overcome. Every test you will pass in the name of Jesus. I pray for you because the devil is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. Jesus said to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wind, but I have prayed for you. I pray for you also today that you will not lose your patience and give in to anger and give in to the flesh because Satan is agitating people in the times that we're in with what's in the news is getting people agitated. Sometimes you hear stuff and you want to go slap somebody. No, when you hear stuff, love somebody. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Alrighty, let us receive the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. We use those words exactly because Jesus says, this bread is my body, this wine is my blood. As often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. What do we remember? We call to remembrance, rather, all these same forces that govern life, that Jesus laid down himself so that we can be glorified. The King of Kings became the servant of all so that we can be kings and priests unto our God. When next you come testing, you will find me sitting in authority as a king, not losing my cool, but giving glory to God. 
in Jesus' name. You may eat and you may drink in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Alan is going to come up in a moment to close out the service and receive the offering. But I want to give you a moment very quickly to bring that issue before the Lord while I was speaking earlier on about making a plan. You have tried. There's somebody here, it's not the first time that you've heard that. You have tried, but you just can't get past yourself. You keep plugging yourself back into the equation. There is a mirror here today. And the Lord wants you to stand before that mirror that you may see yourself. If you are that person, you know in your heart, you know you are not meant to be building on your own ability, but you keep plugging yourself back. And I want to pray for you real quick. I want you to come forth. And when I say that there is a mirror here, the same way that the Lord will show me things, I see a mirror here. And what that is, is God is giving you an opportunity to see yourself for who you really are so that you can recognize your limits and give them up so that you can get God's own strength. Yes. And so as many people as want to tap into that grace one by one, just come and stand here. Just imagine that the mirror is kind of like in line with this pulpit. Actually, let me, do you, let me do you a favor here. You know me, I try to stay in alignment with what I see. You see, because I do not claim myself to be anything that I'm not. I just go with what the Lord shows me. Because it will be a shame if God would reveal a thing to me and we don't follow through, then why, what is the point? Alrighty, so Lady Z, yes. as you stand here today in the mighty name of Jesus, every false confidence in human ability leaves your life from today in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the wisdom to be confident in God, in Jesus' name. The Lord says, declare over her, let your eyes be opened. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let your eyes be open in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. You see, in case you're wondering how this thing works, the reason why Peter had to deny Jesus was because up until that time, he was very confident in himself. And Jesus had to arrange the situation so that he knows that he's not all that. You know? You see what I mean? Jesus had to, and that was why he had to, and when he denied Jesus three times, that was when he went away and he hid himself for a while because he was like, okay, that's it. Right. From now on, I would only be confident in the Lord. Amen. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I present to you, Lord, in this awesome mirror that we have here today, which is just an extension of your grace for us to be able to see what you're showing us. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this woman will cease plugging herself back into the equation of your grace. She will let go and let you run the show that she may be truly more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Next, you. Alrighty. Just shuffle. Perfect. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this woman. Thank you for how she has responded with joy to your word that's come forth today. That joy will become strength will become guidance, and Lord, above all, let there be a distillation of your wisdom over her. The wisdom to let go, the wisdom to let God, the wisdom to stand in the face of challenges and let the glory of God be seen. I must decrease and he must increase. Let that wisdom of how to decrease and let the Lord increase, let it be made manifest in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, the Lord will lead you to where to go in his word and the shackle will be broken and you will become a new being for this season for the sake of the next, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. You have not been using the power that he has given you enough to bring peace into the lives of other people. Sometimes all you have to do is just lay hands on them and pray for them. Don't debate, don't argue, don't try to even counsel them. You're a woman of great understanding and you know things. You see what I mean? You've been talking to him and still he's not at peace. Why don't you just lay your hands and pray? And by that touch, the burden will be lifted and the yoke will be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know what I'm talking about. Lay your hands. Just lay your hands and pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. The Lord has seen you and you just need to see him. You see, once we've seen the hand of God, 
there is something within us that goes to rest. But sometimes if we haven't seen it, we're like, oh, is this going to happen? No, it will happen. It will happen. He that will come, will come. God has sent you a man already. He hasn't delivered as much as you want him to deliver. But don't worry. Though he tarries, yet he will not tarry. He will surely come. So just wait. Just wait, just wait, just wait. You see, the Lord has sent you a man that will take you to bring you. And what I mean is, it will come, it will take you to bring you to a place. A place of fullness. You see, I see it, and it has a big sign on the wall, and it just says fullness. And so don't worry. You see, any pain, any discomfort, any agitation, or any feeling of frustration is yours to condemn. Talk them down before they talk you out. Silence the voices and say that I will wait on the Lord. I think it was Job who says, all the days of my vain life, I will wait. It is what God is worth waiting for. What God has for you is worth waiting for. You need to be the voice of encouragement in the ear of the other. To say, don't worry, God said, and when he says, he does. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are not in that equation. Only God is, and he's going to give you the result that his name may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. When I say you're not in the equation, what I mean is your hand isn't. You are there as a recipient, but he is the doer. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for the obedience of this man. I see you literally as a dog waiting for the next instruction. God should just say it and you will do it. And so, Father, in the matter name of Jesus, as this man, like Caleb, and if you're wondering, I'm not insulting him, Caleb actually literally means a dog. And he named his own son Caleb, so it's not me. You understand what I mean? But that just is a reflection of his heart before the Lord, waiting to capture the next instruction. You see? And so, all you have to do Nathan, is just wait. Everything that is yours to do, you have already done. You have sought. You have asked. You have put the word out there. And the Lord says, now you wait. It will be brought to you. They will call you and say, is this it? And then you will ask the Lord, is this it? And the Lord will say, it is. And you will tell them it is. And it's going to be done. You see what I mean? They will be offering you things. They will say, oh, it comes with this. It comes with that. We'll take care of this. We'll take care of that. All you have to do is wait. And you will not wait for long. You see, you will not wait for long, but you have to wait. There's a little wait period. How be it, you must wait on the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Let those wings now come into full function. Yes, Lord. Now it's time for them. It's time for them to rise and to lift this man. Oh, yes. His burden is light. His yoke is easy. You will begin to feel the lightness. Even bodily, you will feel it. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. God is good. Are you standing here also, Kenyatta? Or you're just helping? Okay, alrighty. God is good. You know, because sometimes you don't know who. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Um, so, you, are, you know, when, when you came on Saturday, God told you that he has a word for you. You came, you got the word, and the word says that you, in the vision that I saw, you were wearing the robe of a judge, and the Lord says to pass the judgment. So, just keep telling yourself, I'm a judge. I just need to speak. I just need to pass the verdict. I need to echo what my father has said. I'm not the police that will execute the judgment. I'm not the one that will take them and lock them up. I'm not the one that will punish them. I'm not the one that will do, just tell yourself again and again, I am a judge because my father made me so. You see what I mean? <laughs> pass the judgment. Commit them into the hand of the Lord. You see those ones that continue to tug on your heart, such that every time you think about them, as much as you want to be loving, as much as you want to be kind and forgiving, there is still something that is like, ah. The Lord is saying, pass the judgment of the righteous, and you will have peace within, and you will see joy without. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will hear a sound. You will hear a sound. It's a boom sound. It's a sound of something broken. And once you hear that sound, the calls will pour in. The letters will arrive. But you will hear that sound in the mighty name of Jesus. Be opened in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. God is good. I actually came to stand proxy for Zoe, but I don't know if she's able to come up. Oh, you're standing in proxy for Zoe. Oh, yeah. Well, that word is for you, though. Oh, yeah. 
That word is for you. Don't worry. You go and pray and prophesy over her. God is good. Praise the Lord. Are you here? Okay, God is good. I will magnify the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Praise God. Praise God. Charles, praise God. Just keep thanking him for the things that you have asked of him. The more you thank him, the more you will see yourself in the place of the receiver and God in the place of the doer. Praise him. Sing songs, praise him. Read Psalms, praise him. Praise him. His praise shall continually be in your mouth. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. All right, Sister Barbara. At the end of the day, it's almost like everybody's here. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you. I thank you because, okay, so here is the deal. There are things that you must do. It's been told to you for a while, and the Lord is saying that there is still a part for you to play. There are certain things that you believe concerning your household, but what are the scriptures? Where have you written them down? How much of those scriptures concerning the situations that you want to see change are you pressing into? It's not enough to just identify the promise. You need to press into it. So you need to go back and just rework your plan and let what you can do, which is quoting those scriptures affirmatively over your household, be your job. You do that. You know exactly what to do. You do that. God has already spoken to you, but he showed it to me that it's not been done as it should be. So go and do it. Go and do it. It's easy. The word of God, this is the promise that God's word says concerning this attitude that I don't want to see, concerning this thing that I don't like, concerning that that I want to see. Lay it before the Lord and speak his word back to him. He says, by the word of my mouth, command you me. We don't have the power to command God. Only the word of God can command God. And that was why he says, by my words, if I said it, then he has power over my power to move my hand. Okay, so it's simple. I'm not trying to move God. God is such a big God, I can't move God. But if I can identify what he has said, I'm like, God, you said this. You said that. So table it before the Lord and the Lord be with you in the mighty name of Jesus. The young man shall find life in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this woman of God. And um, it may not look like it just yet, but by the grace of God, regardless of what's going on in the world for you, it's going to be an amazing year in business. And the Lord is saying, you must decrease I must increase. So sometimes, let me now tell you what I saw. I saw five things that you were putting out that look like five envelopes, and God says, take three back. And so there are times when you want to say five things to people. Only say two, so that they can hear God. Okay? Because of the fact that you're a woman of the world, in the sense of having very great worldly experiences, you know what to say to people. And the Lord is saying, if they're only hearing your voice and your words, then you're not, going to expect, you're not going to see the result that you expect. So sometimes just say two instead of five. And then they will hear what God is saying and that word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 that the words of the heart of a king is in the heart of the Lord. The heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord and like the course of a river, he moves it wherever he wishes. When they hear God, you will have the kind of result that you want. They'll be more cordial with you. They'll be more responsive to you. They'll be more accountable to you because they will hear the words of your heavenly father and the fear of God will come upon them to do that which they should by you in Jesus name Alexis the Lord has already begun to show you signs of great victory just thank him not just for the signs but thank him for the great victory you see you have sought the Lord concerning your household the Lord has heard you this is not just to give you false hope because no man can give anything that is not from above. And so what I'm saying is I'm encouraging you to just press more into what God has already given to you. You see, there's nothing anyone has that he has not received from above and the Lord has given you a glimpse and he wants you to follow that star and you will find where the baby is. The Lord has given you the signs. Follow the signs. Give him thanks for it. Sing praises to him and say, Father, I thank you even if all I have right now is but signs, I am confident because I know the fruits will abound in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for confidence that is unwavering 
unwavering. Confidence that is unwavering in the name of Jesus. And for those of you who may be wondering, why do we lay hands? The Bible says by the laying on of the hands of the eldership, the gifts are stirred up. God already put gifts inside of you. We lay hands for the stirring up of the gift to fulfill all righteousness. You are not receiving from a man just, but you are receiving that which God has already given to you. So be excited about the fact that your heavenly father has already gone ahead of anybody to bless you and he has just chosen this point in time to stir up the gift in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't have to be here till 10 o'clock, so let's keep working on it. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for Josephine. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord said to me to say to you, stop and ask. Before you make a move, just stop and ask. I say, God, okay, I'm just checking you. One last check before I speak to this person. One last check before I do this and do that. You see, what I see you doing is I see you taking a phone from somebody. And the Lord says, she needs to stop and ask. Even if you think that's what you should do, just stop and ask. And at that particular point in time, if the Lord says to do it, do it. And if he says to hold off, hold off. Do not lean on your own understanding. Let his word guide you every step of the way. In the mighty name of Jesus, in this equation, you will see the hand of God mighty and strong on your behalf. You must decrease. He, the Lord Jesus, must increase in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anita, thank you. It's your glory season. It's your glory season. It's your glory season. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, those... So I'm just going to say this very quickly because what I hear is that it's time for them to know that your God is God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And they will know. You see, because to them, you are doing too much. But that's because they haven't seen a result that matches your confidence in God. When that result begins to materialize, in fact, it might have been yesterday as I was praying for you that I saw this, it's just coming to me again. When it's time for your result to materialize, then they will recognize that you were not doing too much, that you were just being an obedient child of God, an example for them to follow in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I want you to speak peace over yourself and just speak peace into situations and just say, peace, be still. Speak peace ahead of time. Speak peace while you're in the midst of the storm. Just speak and say the peace of God that is beyond understanding come upon you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Ma'am, thank you for coming out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for my sister here for the bold step of faith that she has taken. Lord, I pray for you. And I want you to open your eyes to look at me. In the mighty name of Jesus, in this season, the Lord has a word for you. You will see angels. I tell you what, I see you walking, whether it's in a dream or in reality, and your eyes were opened, and you received an angelic visitation, and you recognized it. This is not one of those, the Lord was here and I knew it not. You will see and you will just beam with a smile. It's just for the faith in you that is yet to rise so that it can rise on the behalf of those whom you love. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this is my sister's season to see angels. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know how many times you're gonna have the experience, but I keep singing one angel in particular. Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, Chris, now you know what you must do. In fact, for you, you have only come out to fulfill all righteousness. As the word of the Lord was coming forth, I saw you, not in the physical, but I saw you actually making check boxes and saying, yeah, now I know what I must do. Now I know what I must do. Now I know what I must do. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, he will not relent from this new position of committing his ways unto you. He will not take back that which he has already surrendered to you. He will not find himself once again trusting in himself as his heart has shifted in repentance before you today. He will remain in that state of repentance until he has borne fruits that are worthy of your conviction over his life. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't worry. Don't take it back what you have given to the Lord. Just lay it at his feet and then walk away. He's got you covered, Chris. Yes. And, and, and you're a king and you will be seen as such because you are God's own son, a king and a priest in this realm. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will not lose your cool. Praise the Lord. All righty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're here for Riley? Oh, for Ray. For, oh, for your son, Ray. 
Ah, it's a very serious word. I'm not even sure I'm going to deliver it. Um, I see the word rebuke. You see, the Bible says, whom the father loves, he chastises. A rebuke is coming. A rebuke is needed. And the Lord is only saying, do not stand in the way. Do not stand in the way. Let the rebuke come forth to wake this man up and to set him on the path that he should be. The rebuke comes. Do not stand in the way. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Is that everybody? God is good. Honestly speaking, I wish we could just keep going, but let us cut it short in righteousness. Alan, God bless you, everybody. You may be seated. Don't worry. We're only going to be another two or three minutes. Please, just bear with us. Hallelujah. If you help us with the offering slide, thank you, sir. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you. There's none like you, O oh God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, O oh God. We thank you for your mercy. We'll have the giving details on the screen. And let us give tonight in faith. Let us give tonight as a sign of what the Lord brings us into, of his word, of his promise of his word that is forever settled in heaven. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to get that in order to our family online. You'll see the giving details there at Communion House for Cash App and PayPal, as well as a Zelle contact number for you there. Give in faith. Hallelujah. If you have your offer, you can go ahead and lift it up. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you because your spirit leads us into all truth. Lord, look upon these offerings. And Lord, if we found favor in your sight, let them be pleasing unto you. Let them be sweet smelling. Oh God, we thank you for the angelic that you have placed around us. For even if you have ministered, oh God, that we've come to the company of innumerable angels. Lord, we declare that by your spirit we shall indeed do the good work, oh God, that you have set for us to do. Father, we thank you for every seed that has come before. For we know that you give seed to the sower and you own the cattle on a thousand hill. Be glorified in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Family, what a night. Let's go in love and peace and just soak up this atmosphere that is here. Take it home with you. Everyone have a blessed night.